as the monstrous beast takes a devastating punch from the first king. It goes down like a sack of potatoes, sending shockwaves that scatter nearby soldiers like bowling pins. Amidst the settling dust, there stands Corporal Lee, clutching the vice president making sure she does not go flying off into the stratosphere from the pressure. Taking a closer look, we see the vice president informing Corporal Lee that she has blessed him with mana, but she cannot afford to expend more since she believes the other teammates are more crucial. Corporal Lee, with a pleasant smile, reassures her that he will be fine and tells her not to worry about him since he is not planning to use his body anyway. But then, he abruptly snaps his hand out of her grasp and leaps down to the ground, heading towards the monster. Meanwhile, the platoon leader, as always, is throwing shade at him, asking what the heck he is trying to pull off this time. Now, here comes the Fist King again, grinning like a maniac with that gaping mouth of his, clearly having the time of his life. He starts throwing punches at the monster like it is a punching bag at the gym. The poor monster, after taking a beating of its life, starts crumbling into pieces. And just as the monster begins to disintegrate, Corporal Lee whips out his metal-smashing technique. That is when the Fist King smells something fishy in the air, realizing a shady move is about to go down. Suddenly, the monster's chest explodes into a million bits, raining its insides down on the battlefield. The Fist King lands swiftly on the ground, bewildered by the unexpected turn of events. It is like someone snatched his kill right from under his nose before he could claim it. Then, a notification window pops up, spilling all the juicy details about the metal smashing ability. It is a rank D skill, and it seems to consume mana to crush metal, with the mana consumption varying based on the amount of metal targeted. Right now, Corporal Lee's mana is sitting at a measly 13%. Now, Corporal Lee stands tall beside the Fist King, both watching as the monster teeters on the brink of oblivion. With a stern tone, the Fist King turns to our guy, demanding to know what the heck he wants. He reminds Lee that he would already warned everyone not to mess with his kills, yet here Lee is, snatching victory right out of his jaws. But Corporal Lee is not about to take any guff. He snaps back, calling out the Fist King for his questionable ethics, even for an S-ranker. The Fist King, now boiling with rage, demands to know what Lee is blabbering about, denying any wrongdoing. That is when Lee hits him with a reality check, reminding the Fist King that he was the one who interrupted Lee's raid in the first place, so ultimately, Corporal Lee deserves this kill. The Fist King scoffs, questioning whether a mere Corporal like Lee could have taken down the monster solo. But Lee, cool as a cucumber, tells the Fist King to buzz off. And that is when things really heat up. The Fist King, completely losing his cool, threatens to squash Lee's head with a single fist. Out of nowhere, they both start sprinting toward the monster, each determined to land the killing blow and claim the glory for themselves. As Corporal Lee hurls his knife towards the monster, he is bellowing at the top of his lungs, letting the Fist King know that they are the ones who held the line until the bitter end. He is not about to let this so-called Fist King swoop in at the last moment and snatch his reward. Meanwhile, the Fist King is hot on Corporal Lee's tail, his eyes locked on Lee's sword. He is just as dead set on nabbing the kill before Corporal Lee can get his hands on it. And amidst this chaotic showdown, the poor monster is probably wondering what the heck these guys find so fascinating about him. It is like being the unwitting star of a very strange and violent reality show. So, they both reach the monster, and Corporal Lee's sword starts slicing its way into the monster's belly while the Fist King launches his fist straight at the monster as well. The monster reels from the onslaught, crackling with lightning and fire as it takes a serious beating. Then, the Fist King gears up for another devastating blow, unleashing it with full force. The monster crashes to the ground, engulfing the entire vicinity in blazing flames. The shockwaves are so intense that even Lee struggles to keep his footing. Finally, we are outside, and the blob that once swallowed Soul Station begins to vanish as the monster lies defeated. The area is now free from its grip. As the blob dissipates, Soul Station is revealed once again against the sky. Among the civilians, word spreads that the monster was taken down in less than five minutes after the Fist King entered the fray. Finally, the survivors trapped in the station for hours start emerging. In the crowd, a concerned lady rushes towards her mother, immediately asking if she is okay or if she got hurt anywhere else. The mother warmly embraces her daughter, reassuring her not to worry that she is alright. But then tears start welling up in the lady's eyes after the heartfelt hug, emotions running high after the intense catastrophe. Finally, relief washes over everyone as they realize they are safe after the harrowing ordeal. The news spreads across TVs, with reporters announcing a miracle. All the people in Seoul Station survived once again. A notification pops up, confirming that the monster, the venomous ironclad spider queen, has been finally slain. It also congratulates survivors for enduring the unlucky event, hinting at lucky rewards for those who weathered the storm. Now, we see the Fist King looking at the system window, but he does not seem too thrilled with the outcome. Maybe he was hoping for a bit more recognition, or perhaps the rewards did not meet his expectations. As we glance at the system window, it reveals that a lucky reward will be given to the Fist King for assisting in the defeat of the boss monster. Now it is clear why he is seething with anger. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee is busy performing some wizardry while still lodged in the corpse of the Monster Queen, a clear indication of why our guy got the kill.
Then, a notification pops up, indicating that an unknown energy is imbuing the cloud blade, reaching 24%. Finally, we see our guy casually snagging the reward the system threw his way. The bracelet he yearned for in his previous life is finally in his possession, and he gazes at it with wide eyes. Suddenly, another system window chimes in, stating that the user has obtained a man in a Nackler secret armor. It is a hero-grade relic with the trait that the user can level up the armor through battles. When infused with mana, it creates a thin layer of transparent armor over the user's skin, making it perfect for carrying and storing special features. It even contains a subspace that allows the user to secretly store items. And so, in the grand saga of Soul Station's chaos, our dude emerges as the hero, grinning like a devil who just got the last slice of pizza. Meanwhile, the Fist King is more disappointed than a kid who opened socks for Christmas, calling our guy a cheeky bastard and demanding answers. But as steam starts rising from our guy, he is not about to let the Fist King reign on his parade. He munches down on the bracelet reward like it is his last meal, while the Fist King throws a tantrum louder than a toddler denied candy at the checkout line. Our man turns around, giving the Fist King a look that could curdle milk, and sets him straight. He asks what reward is he talking about, and makes it clear that they are the ones who saved the day. He should be thanking Corporal and his team for letting this party crash her tag along like a lost puppy. And just like that, he drops the mic, leaving the Fist King fuming like a kettle about to explode. But hey, you gotta hand it to the Fist King for his persistence, even if he is more stubborn than a mule with a headache. He keeps going on about how the system works, like he is the guru of game mechanics. He then mentions that, the boss monster's contribution is 7%, so his share is still bigger than Corporal's ego. As we glance at the fuming Fist King, his eyes shimmering with frustration and anger, he reveals that he endured six months of isolated training, only to be dragged into this mess out of nowhere. He firmly believes he deserves a hero-grade item at the very least to balance things out. With a terrifying tone and demeanor, he demands once again how Corporal Lee plans to make up for it. But our man could not care less about the Fist King's cocky attitude. A sly grin dances on Corporal Lee's lips as he thinks. This dude must be kidding, arguing about time and compensation in front of a soldier who had to return to military duty for all this bullcrap self-labor. Suddenly, the entire area crackles with energy, fire intensifying around the Fist King like he is about to explode. He demands if Lee knows who he has dared to mess with, but Lee just shrugs it off, daring him to bring it on because Corporal Lee is not scared one bit. The Fist King can spout all the nonsense about solitary training and his contribution, but in Lee's eyes, it does not freaking matter, because if the Corporal had to be compensated fairly for all the time he has spent fighting, then no reward could ever make up for it. So, Corporal Lee is ready to take this bastard down. No holds barred. Sure enough, the Fist King lunges at our guy with all his might, ready to land a punch that would make even Superman jealous. But just before impact, it is like someone hit the pause button on life. As the scene transitions, we see the battalion commander and the Flower Guild president, bursting onto the scene like unexpected guests at a party. The Fist King's jaw practically hits the floor, while our guy's expression is like a confused emoji come to life. Then, Lieutenant Colonel Kim Kangsiak decides to drop some wisdom bombs, asking why they are all throwing punches when the gates are closed. Talk about raining on their parade. But Corporal Lee, ever the opportunist, seizes the moment like a kid catching the ice cream truck at just the right time. He grabs the Fist King's fist, but instead of a fight, he launches into a barrage of compliments, showering the Fist King with praise like confetti at a parade. With a swift nod and a cheeky wink, Corporal Lee makes his exit, leaving the Fist King standing there like a deer caught in headlights. And as Lee walks away, he salutes his senior like he is in some kind of military sitcom. The commander can only shake his head in disbelief, while Lee, with a grin as wide as the Grand Canyon, assures him that he is perfectly fine. Thank you very much. But the Fist King is not having any of this nonsense. He screams at Corporal Lee, demanding that he get his ass over here. However, before things escalate further, the Flower Guild lady jumps in like a superhero with a verbal lasso, telling the Fist King to shut his big mouth. She admits she has no clue what is going on, but right now, she just wants him to shut his ass up. As tensions simmer down, our attention shifts to the sky, where TV news choppers capture every juicy moment of the Soul Station incident, broadcasting live to the entire nation. The Flower Guild president makes a point that if the Fist King causes any more trouble, it will be impossible to contain the fallout, and it will not do any favors for the Blue Flower Guild's reputation. Still fuming, the Fist King realizes he is backed into a corner, with no choice but to face the harsh reality of the situation. Suddenly, a voice booms out, urging everyone to make way because the Brigadier General is on his way. Sure enough, a portal begins to materialize, and with a flourish, the teleport opens, revealing the Brigadier General floating in like he owns the place. Turning towards the Fist King, the Brigadier General cannot help but express his amusement at seeing the Fist King still lingering around. But the Fist King is still sulking, not exactly thrilled with the idea of heading home empty-handed, without any shiny medals or rewards. 
the general also notices the awkward tension radiating from the Fist King. Not to mention the Flower Guild president is also standing there like a lost puppy. Taking a moment, the brigadier expresses his intrigue once again, noting the presence of even the Blue Flower Guild master's daughter. He then asks if there is any problem here, but the Flower Guild lady tries to play it cool, warmly welcoming the general and brushing off any notion of trouble, stating that the gate is already closed now. The general gives a knowing twinkle in his eye, acknowledging that if they are talking about the Blue Flower Guild, there must be no problems there. The Flower Guild lady catches on to his wavelength, understanding exactly what the old coot is getting at. Meanwhile, the general turns to the lieutenant, who promptly salutes his senior. Back to the Flower Guild lady, she is grilling the Fist King like a master chef, wondering why Soul Station looks like it got hit by a tornado when the Fist King was supposed to handle it without breaking a sweat. But the Fist King is still stuck on the fact that someone stole his thunder. Then, he drops the bombshell that he did not actually wreck Soul Station or clinch the top spot in the raid. The president's jaw hits the floor faster than a cartoon character realizing they have run off a cliff, demanding to know what the heck he means he is not the first. But the Fist King is in no mood for further discussion. He reminds the Flower Guild lady that he has fulfilled all his responsibilities and insists that it is time for her to keep her promises as well. With that, he takes flight into the sky, leaving the lady reeling in the shockwave of his departure. She is left baffled by the revelation that the S-Ranker who is known as the Fist King did not rank first in a mere level 15 unlucky event. She wonders who the hell could have ranked first then. Meanwhile, back with our guy, he is getting an earful from the general, who is finding it absurd that his military records specify Corporal Lee can only control up to 300 grams of metal, yet his reports now suggest he can control way more than that. Finally realizing that it must be the corporal who snagged the first spot, the general continues his tirade, suggesting that either the records are wrong or there is the possibility that Lee is not truly an F-ranker. The Flower Guild lady, overhearing everything, starts to sweat beads at the realization that this dude might just be a freaking F-ranker. The old coot, with a pleasant smile, finds the whole fiasco quite fascinating and demands a detailed debriefing while they take a walk. Because apparently, even in the midst of chaos, there is always time for a stroll. As the reality sinks in, the Flower Guild lady feels like her head is about to explode as she wonders what is going on. Meanwhile, our guy takes a leisurely stroll with the budget-friendly mob psycho. But at this point, Corporal Lee shoots him a doubtful glance. He is on high alert because he knows that Brigadier General Choi yun Chiao is not a man to be trifled with. Choi's powers have earned him the reputation of a tactical nuclear weapon, and to top it off, he is remarkably clever. He is the one even the necromancer was most wary of, having attempted several assassination attempts against him. Finally, the general breaks the silence, demanding a report of what happened earlier. Corporal Lee snaps into action with a soldier's energy, but he cannot shake the feeling that the general suspects him of some unusual activity compared to his recorded abilities. He halts his steps and brings them closer together, adopting the stance of a disciplined soldier. It is time to stay sharp, because when the brigadier general starts asking questions, you better have your answers ready. And so the corporal starts spitting out that not long ago, when he caught his second elite monster, his abilities instantly improved with an achievement message saying Dunce Rebellion. Instead of the 300 grams as reported, he is now handling up to 17 kilograms and has gained a few skills during his improvement spree. The general starts to wonder that achievement systems are certainly just as uncommon as quests. But right now, the only thing on the corporal's mind is that he does not want the world to know that F-rankers can progress. With a broad grin, the general buys our guy's story, but deep down, the corporal knows the general is not fully sold on it yet. Then the general explains that given the corporal's fighting strength and abilities, he could not be called an F-ranker, and his combat abilities are perhaps C rank or above. Now the corporal hits with the realization that it seems the general also wants to scout him as well. So, the general gives a nod of praise to our boy for his fantastic job and asks if there is something he would like as a reward. Maybe some magic armor or anything. He tells him to name it, and he will have it. But Corporal Lee seems relieved that the general does not want to scout him. Seeing an opportunity to snag a shiny item, a grin widens on Lee's face as he reveals that there is actually something he wants. Then, he challenges the general, saying it is just that he does not think even a brigadier general could give it to him so easily. Now, the brigadier is even more curious to hear what this thing is that he cannot grant him. And with a drum roll, Lee bluntly states that it is one of the general's treasured items, a hero rank item called the Fail Knot. Suddenly, a sparkling realization hits the general as if Corporal Lee just found out about the stash of dirty magazines the general was hiding from his wife. It is a moment of pure comedic gold, where the general's poker face crumbles faster than a house of cards in a windstorm. Back at the broken down soul station, the general is laughing so hard he is practically holding onto his belly like he just heard the joke of the year. With a playful twinkle in his eye, the general tells Corporal Lee, let us have a chat when you get another badge right on your chest. Corporal Lee, with all the soldierly energy he can muster, replies with a crisp, Thank you, sir. As the general starts to stride away, still chuckling to himself, Lee cannot help but sulk a little. He saw this coming from a mile away. He knew that old man was going to change the subject faster than a politician dodges a tough question. 
but despite the disappointment of not getting his hands on the fail knot, Lee is still relieved. After all, a special promotion means he will be able to stay hidden for a while longer, and for now, that is victory enough for him. So a few days pass by, and we find ourselves at the 3rd Armored Brigade, 1st Battalion. A notification window pops up, stating that Manon and Mackler's secret armor is being digested, and in Vebo Furin efficiency is at 150%, with about 6 minutes left until metal absorption is complete. As he sits on his bed, our guy is just pissed off at how long this is taking, but he reassures himself that hero rank items are harder to digest after all. Suddenly, Private Park appears on the scene, interrupting our guy's sulking. Along with him is Private Choi Mini, whose trade is chaser and is an E-rank guy, demanding they do something other than PT now. But our man pulls up his shirt, showing his banged up body, and asks them if they cannot see he is totally bruised up. Then we see three other goons arrive at the scene. One with a bald head, Private Choi Tiong, whose trade is sniper and is also an E-ranker. The one in the middle is Private Park Sungmo, with the trade of a shaman and an E-ranker, and the purple-headed one is Kim Kyungjin, with the trade of a thief and also an E-ranker. As Corporal Lee reflects on the past events, he finds solace in the camaraderie forged through fire and chaos. In the midst of raids and life-threatening situations, he is grateful for the steadfast support of his friends and comrades who stood by his side, unwavering in their faith and trust. Just as he is lost in his thoughts, the door creaks open, and in walks Private On Minty, back from the military hospital after getting roughed up in the last confrontation with the Kobolds. Reporting for duty, Minty's return is like a beacon of hope amidst the uncertainty of battle. Without a moment's hesitation, Corporal Lee jumps to his feet and wraps Minty in a bear hug, a silent testament to the bond they share. For Lee, future rewards pale in comparison to the simple joy of seeing his friends return safely by his side. As Minty stands bewildered by the unexpected display of affection, Lee chuckles and explains that it is all for him showing up just in time for training. Though Minty might not fully grasp Lee's sentiment, the warmth of their embrace speaks volumes. With cheerful energy, Lee leads the way, surrounded by his comrades and friends. In this moment of shared camaraderie, they form a tight-knit circle of support, ready to face whatever challenges lie ahead. After all, in the chaos of battle, there is no greater comfort than knowing your friends have got your back. As Corporal Lee leads everyone to the training center, he is determined to ensure their safety through rigorous preparation. But, a sudden interruption halts their progress. We see Private Park, looking visibly shaken, comes running down and stammers out that Ka and lower rankers are not permitted to use this training facility. In his eyes, it is a place reserved for the elite, and mere mortals like them have no business treading its hallowed halls. Sounds like Corporal Lee's got quite the challenge ahead of him, and I'm quite eager to see how his plan unfolds in the next part. If you're curious to know the same, please stay tuned for the next episode. Until next time.